say so. Oh, left the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Say so. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you. We honor your word. We pray that you just help us to, to, to hear you this morning, Lord God. That, Father, we don't hear the voices of fear or uh, any kind of other disturbances. But, Father, that we hear you, Lord God. In Jesus' my name we pray. Amen. And amen. You may have a seat this morning. Praise God. I know we have lots of people out of town and lots of people that weren't feeling too well and so they're not able to be here but uh, we thank all of you for being here we're going to talk about uh, um, a series that we, we ca we're calling crisis fatigue crisis fatigue okay you know when you go through a situation sometimes it can leave you tired it can leave you drained when we started all this back in spring break you know, they said after spring break. Then they said, you know, a week after spring break. Then at the beginning of April, they said, hey, give us 15 days. 15 days, and it's all over. 15 days, and everything goes back to normal. 15 days, and things begin to change. 15 days, give us 15 days. After 15 days, they said, hey, you know what? Give us another 15 days. Another 15 days went by. Now they're saying, you know, give us a month. Now they're saying, hey, it's over. Now they're saying, hey, give us, give us another month. Give us, hey, whatever the situation may be. And, you know, if you get caught up in it, if you get consumed in it, it can cause you to get tired physically, emotionally, and even spiritually, okay? Crisis. When you get in the crisis, sometimes it can leave you tired and drained, okay? And so I want to talk about crisis fatigue. And I want to look at the book of Joshua. I want to look at Joshua's life. Because Joshua had a lot of crisis. From the very beginning, the man had crisis. I mean, from the very beginning, you know, he's getting ready. He's, gonna, he's like, you know, I'm with the man of God. And we're going to do great things. And God has promised us some things. And we're going to prosper. And we're going into a land, a land that flows with milk and honey. And God is going to do some great things. And as he gets ready to just be the supportive role, all of a sudden, Moses dies. All of a sudden, he's confronted with all kinds of situations. And if you read Joshua's life, time after time, battle after battle, he's confronted with different situations. He's confronted with uh, AI. He's confronted with, with uh, uh, Jericho. He's confronted with so many things in his camp. And so he gets to the end, almost to the end of his ministry almost to the end of the fight of faith in his life and you know all this crisis and it can leave you fatigued well there were some people in the camp that were going through crisis fatigue okay they were already going through situations they were already beginning to murmur and complain but I like what Joshua said okay and I want to start by reading verse 14 and 15 we've read it before but I want to read it again it says in Joshua 24 15 14 and 15 it says now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Say with me, faithfulness. Serving God is not just serving God in the good times. It's also serving God in the tough times. Okay? I mean, it's real easy to be a leader when you're not going through a pandemic. Right? It's easy to be a parent when kids are at their best. Woo! It's awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's easy to be a spouse when marriage is going well. It's easy to be the boss when the company's doing well. But listen, he says, I want you to serve him with all faithfulness. He says, throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Okay, Joshua was laying down the law, man. He was letting his kids know. He was letting his family know. He was letting his camp know, hey, this is my standard, okay? And then he says the, the famous uh, quote, the famous words, we see it all over uh, Pinterest and, and, and we see it all over uh, uh, pictures and posters and everything, but it says here, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day 
whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Woo! What a powerful, powerful statement. I mean, he laid down the law. Hey, listen, in the middle of chaos, in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of everybody wanting to do their own thing, in the middle of everybody thinking, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and, and families were going crazy, and it was starting to scatter, and it was starting to fall apart, Joshua got up and said, hey, you know what? That's what y'all want? Do it. Go for it. You want to serve those gods? Go for it. You want to serve those other gods? Go for it. You want to serve God or you don't want to serve God? If it seems undesirable to you, you know what? You just don't feel like it? Don't do it. But I'm going to tell you one thing. He said, as for me and my house, oh, you bet we're going to serve the Lord. Whoo! Isn't that a powerful, powerful standard? Man, as parents today, do you know that's a scary, scary thing to do sometimes? But listen, how many of you know we need to? How many of you know that there's leaders in churches across America that are afraid to make that statement? How many of you know that there's parents in households right now that are afraid to make that statement? They weren't afraid to make it back in my day. Hello, somebody? Anybody around 40-something? Huh? I know those of you that are 50-something had those standards. Huh? Kids were, or parents were not afraid of kids back in those days. Can I get an amen? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but watch this. The past few months, hey, I understand, crisis has mentally and physically drained us. People are fatigued. I mean, not only do we have to work, not only do we have to get the kids this and, and do this and run around this and, and do all this and have a great relationship with our spouses and have a great relationship with our kids, but, but now we have to deal with the politics going on, and, and now we have to deal with, with, with COVID, and now we have to deal with, with masks, and now we have to deal with lines, and now we have to deal with this, and we have to deal with the other, and, and just so many things now. Hey, you know, we're, 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 we're drained. We're physically crisis fatigued people are fatigued in the process we've also felt isolated okay in the process we have not focused guess what because of isolation because of the crisis management in our lives these days because we're so tired of crisis managing we come into crisis fatigue guess what we begin to lose focus on preparing our homes for what God is about to do in our lives and we've kind of lowered the standards, okay? The enemy's playing mind games because of fatigue. And guess what? Christians all across the nation are losing their relationship with God. Less is happening through the local church. I mean, activities are being cut. Youth things are being uh, 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 taken away. Uh, singles groups are being taken away. Uh, um, you know, different kinds of, uh, of, of fellowships are being taken away. And so different things are, are, are starting to happen less through the actual local church physically, okay? And guess what? It is taking people away from the relationship with God. Can I tell you that your position in a church is not relationship with God? It is the overflow of a relationship with God. Okay? So, because I hear people saying, you know, well, well, now that I'm not leading, I can do. No, no, no. Because you're a Christian, you're going to have some values and some standards in your life. Not because you're a preacher. Not because you're a leader. Not because you have a position. Not because of any other reason. Hey, because I'm a believer, I have some standards in my life. Okay, so watch this. We can understand and we can know that God will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Joshua had a good associate by the name of Caleb. And when he and Joshua were in their 40s, man, they were some strong brothers. I mean, they, they, they overcame some obstacles. They overcame some giants. In fact, Caleb was his partner in crime, man. And at one time when everybody else was scared of a crisis, Joshua and Caleb said, hey, we can take them. We can take anybody because God is with us. 
Everybody else said, oh my gosh, we can't take these people. We can't overcome and be in this land. We look like grasshoppers in their midst. They're huge. They're giants. They're this. They're more powerful. But Joshua and Caleb were people of faith. And they were like, hey, if God says we can do it, we can do all things. Let's go. Okay? So he has his partner. His name is Caleb. You can read about him. And Caleb was four in his 40s. Joshua was in his 40s. They were strong. And they go through the years leading the people, leading the people, leading the people. Caleb was always with Joshua, always with Joshua, never left. Even in the middle of pandemics, even in the middle of situations, even in the middle of a crisis, he never left Joshua's side. All of a sudden, they find themselves at 85 years old. Whew, can you imagine? 85 years old, and they're walking, and you know, Joshua's at, 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 the, at the point of coming to this place where he lays a standard and says, hey, I'm about to come to the end of my calling, of my ministry, of my life, but I'm setting a standard as to what I expect in my home and in my place. And, and, and at the time, right before he does that, he has this friend Caleb that's still with him. And Caleb, all of a sudden, as they're walking, they're 85 years old now, they look at a mountain that was once promised to him by God at the age of 45. Watch this. So like 40 years pass by, and he looks up, and he says, Joshua, I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to let you go on, but I'm going to take what God promised me. At 85 years old. And he said, you know what? I'm going to take, I know there's giants. I know there's other crises to confront. But I still feel as strong as I did back when we were in our 40s, man. And I'm taking my mountain. And Caleb took what was promised to him. Watch this. The enemy wants to fatigue us in the middle of this crisis. Because he has so many, prom, uh, so many promises, God has so many promises for us that if he can get us to give up before the promise, if he can get us to get tired before receiving what God has for us, if he can get us to forget about and to lose our relationship with God, we'll lose out on the promise that God has given us. We can't get tired. We can't give up right now. And so Joshua, in these verses, at the beginning, uh, uh, before verse 14, he begins to tell his culture. He begins to tell his people. He says, listen, let me give you a history lesson. God was with us this time, and God was with us then, and God brought us through here, and, God, and just gave them a, 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 an example and gave them the story of everything God had given them and brought them through. And see, he says, and so therefore, if, if, if you don't want to serve God anymore, that's fine. But I know the God that I serve, Joshua said. And as for me in my house, whew, he's done so much for me to give up on him now. He's done so much for my family to give up on him now. Oh, he healed me when I was going through a bad situation physically. And he helped me when I was going through a rough patch in my marriage. And he was with me when my kids were growing up. And man, he was with me in the middle of a pandemic. And guess what? As for you, you can do what you want. But as for me in my house, I'm not giving up on God because God has not given up on me. And as for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You make up your mind what you want to do. Isn't that awesome? So listen, if you're, if you're here and you're, and you're young and, and if you're listening to this or, or if you're young in the Lord or you just started serving God and you, and you haven't been in the faith very long and you wonder, why are these guys being so stubborn on still going to church, on still worshiping, on still trying to put out the word through uh, different ways that God has given us now? Why? Because of the fact that God has been so good to us in the years past and he'll continue to be so good to us and we are not about to stop doing what God has called us to do because God has been faithful. God has been faithful. And we can't forget what he's done for us in our lives. You know, we live in a generation where we forget what he did for us yesterday. Oh, God, I need you right now. Man, if you do this for me. And God brings you through. And guess what? Tomorrow, we forget about God. Listen, we need a generation that will never, ever forget what God has done for them and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So then, watch this. 
Joshua is confronted with some situations. And I want to talk to you about influence because influence is very important. As parents, as Christians, as leaders, we are all influencers. Okay? You're an influence. Whether you know it or not, you are an influence. There's people watching you. There's people noticing you. There are people that you're going to influence in certain ways of your life. Joshua was an influence for his people. Joshua was such an influence that he was at the verge of either steering this culture and this next generation away from God or bringing a conviction that would steer them closer to God. My question to you is, what kind of influence are you being to those around you? Are you bringing people closer to God? Are you bringing a conviction for your next generation and the next generation and the next generation of people that will serve God because of your convictions? Or are you steering them further away and into the pattern of the world? Joshua steered them toward godly standards contrary to family popularity. Parents and leaders, what kind of influences will we be in the middle of this crisis? Will they see that we crumble when things get tough? Will they see that we have fear? Will they see that we are given up? Will they see that we're going to lower our standards just because there's hardly any more accountability anymore? Will they see that just because just because we have an excuse to stay home, we're going to stay home now? Will, they, will, 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 they, will we give them an excuse not to follow God in the days that we're living? Because as leaders, we're influencers. We're influencers. Huh? Kids want to be like their fathers. Young ladies want to be like their mothers. We're influences, okay? We're influences. As teachers, we influence. As preachers, we influence. As leaders, as different people around you, we are influencers, okay? So I want to talk real quick, real quick, just real quick on three different levels. I want to talk to spouses. I want to talk to parents. And I want to talk to you Christians as leaders. Spouses, parents, and leaders, believers, okay? We're influences. Spouses, okay? And I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking to either spouse, husband or wife. In the middle of a crisis, you need each other and your family needs you to be a godly standard, okay? Now watch this. You are an influencer, on your spouse, okay? And you're, 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 you're a big influence. And what kind of influence are you going to be to help make some decisions that are godly in the days to come? Because as spouses, whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, you either make it easier for the other spouse or you make it harder. Are you going to be that spouse that says, oh, man, you know, don't let them talk to you like that. Don't let them say, hey, you need to do. Or are you going to be the spouse that says, hey, you know what? Let's go to God, and let's see what God has to say about it. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but our battle is against principalities and powers and struggles in high places. Hey, let's let God take care of the situations. Are you going to be a spouse that says, hey, you know what? Let's leave with everybody else because it looks like it's a pandemic, and we need to figure something else out. Hey, are you going to be the spouse that supports your husband or your wife and says, hey, I'm with you and we're going to believe God and we're going to see this through? Or are you going to be a spouse that discourages and that tears down the house? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a wise woman builds her home. The Bible says that as husbands, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We have a responsibility one to another, and we have to build each other up. Even in moments of crisis, if one loses his head, the other has to have composure and say, hey, wait a minute, slow down, stop. Let's pray about this. Before we react, let's pray. Are you with me? Spouses, you need each other. Spouses, you need to come together because there are families right now that are being shaken, and together you need to make godly 
decisions. And so here's what I wrote on my, on my notes. Spouses, are you influencing your spouse and family towards upholding biblical standards? Or are you going to give in to the ways of the world? Hmm. Spouses. It's a big deal. Because you make it easier or you make it difficult for your life and your family. You know, one of the reasons it was easy for me to be in ministry full time and for me to do the things that I did was because I had a spouse that supported me. You get this? But I also, she also had a spouse that understood there had to be balance and rhythm as well. Amen? Parents, will we be an influence over our children to lower our standards because of the fact that we're threatened by the possibility of being labeled the mean bad guy in our children's eyes? Whew, we have so many parents right now that we're lowering our standards just because I don't want to be the bad guy. And I'm telling you from somebody that had that problem, you know. My wife, my wife was the bad guy in the family. Oh, yeah, she was a bad guy, you know. I'd go in there, are you going to spank him? Yeah, I'm going to spank him. I'm, 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 I'm doing this, Angela. He can't be doing that stuff. Come on, Aaron. Get in that room and, man, you can't be doing that, boy. Okay, Dad. I'd get out. I'd tell my wife, I did it, man, you know. You, you got to hit him harder. Get in there and hit him. I ain't doing that. Are you crazy? God, you're mean. All right. I would always be the one to say, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not, we're not buying that. I mean, I mean, she would be the one to say, no, no, we're not buying that yet. We have, we have, we have a limit. Remember the limit we talked about? And she'd stick to the limit. On the other hand, I would be like, ah, yeah, we can do a little bit more. Huh? My kids are sharp. My kids are sharp, especially my daughter. When she wants to go shopping and she wants to get something, she doesn't want mom to go. She wants to wait for dad to get home. She wants to take dad on a cruise. That's what we call it. I know she's up to something, Brother Joe, when she says she wants to go on a cruise. We're going to go on a cruise, and, and we just so happen to go by Champs on that cruise, and the Nike shop on the cruise, and everywhere else, $5 tees on the cruise, because of the fact that she knows who gives in. I've toughened up some, man. You know what I'm saying, Brother Renee? Over the years, I toughened up now, brother. I learned, man. I mean... After getting my wallet, I mean, emptied several times, I finally wised up, man. But listen, parents, on a serious note, we can't be afraid of being labeled as the mean parents, as the bad parents, as, as the parents that don't let us do this and don't let us do that. Hey, we've got to have some standards because we're not looking at this temporary feelings that they have. We're looking at the long haul in their life when they're going to need some standards in their life and in their marriages and in their homes. Will we be the ones to be influences in their life that's going to make them strong, that in the, in the future they're going to make some bold, strong decisions for God? Or are we going to be the influences that teaches them to lower their standards when things get tough? Man, I know it's quiet. I don't know how quiet it is on social media, but it's quiet here. Listen, leaders. I want to talk to leaders, believers. Will we be the influencers in this situation, in this pandemic? Or are we so caught up on being popular and attendance and finances and fearing the loss of close relationships due to fitting in with the trends and today's society? Or are we going to preach the truth? You know, it's so much easier to fit in with the trend. It's so much easier to go with the flow. It's so much easier to maybe go with what makes everybody else happy. You know, I mean, we live in a society where we're so concerned with how many likes and how many shares and how many comments that sometimes spiritually we can get caught up in the same situation. 
But hey, I'm not here running for an office. I'm not here trying to get any likes or trying to get any shares or trying to get as many views. I'm not trying to get a job with YouTube and try to get all these money from sponsors to become so popular. My job is to give you a standard, a biblical standard, and let you know, hey, you can do what you want to do. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Because in the long haul, when we see a pandemic, when we see a situation, when we see things rise up, I want you to, I want you to be able to have the faith that can overcome any challenge in your life. Because we're seeing some crazy days. Pastor Arturo in the first service ministered a message on the fact of, could these be the signs of the end of this age? And if so, are we prepared? He talked about the Lamb's book of life. Is your name written in it? Are you prepared? Will you be here during the tribulation? Will you make it through the tribulation if you stay? If you can't handle a pandemic, will you handle a tribulation? If you can't hold your faith in the middle of a pandemic, can you hold your faith in the middle of a tri tribulation? And are you prepared to even go through a tribulation? And hey, listen, I want to tell you, I don't want to be here for that. I want to do things right now. And most importantly, I don't want my kids having to go through a tribulation. Are you with me? Are we going to uphold a standard? Nathan, you can be getting ready to play. Joshua made a bold statement to be a godly influencer and a God pleaser. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Hey, we got to prepare our kids. It's good to direct them in certain ways, in certain areas, and get them focused on certain things. But the most important is to get them focused on where is your faith, son? Where is your faith, daughter? Our most important thing, our most important job, is not to get as many likes as we can on this page, as many shares, as many views on this page, our job is to ask you, where are you in your life? Should the Lord come tomorrow? Are you ready? Should it get worse tomorrow? Should there no, not be any more food on the shelves? Should their jobs be lost all over the country? Should chaos happen all across Washington and the government begin to be shaken like never before and everywhere across America, churches shut down and everything goes uh, crazy? Will you have the faith to still trust God and see miracles in your life? See, that's our job. Not a very popular job, but a very rewarding job in the eyes of God. So here's this. Don't get so crisis fatigued and lose your relationship with God. Stay on course. Stay focused. Don't get so crisis fatigued. Don't get so tired with the media and the noise and everything, all the changes. Don't get so caught up in all the crisis that you get so fatigued and anxiety and just oh, overcome with everything. Hey, take a deep breath. Trust God and just focus on Him. And say, you know, I don't know. Don't know what's going to happen here. Don't know if that's going to happen there. Hey, but one thing I am going to focus on is my relationship with God. You don't have to have a position in a church. You don't have to be a leader in a church to have a relationship with God. Those are overflows of a relationship with God. But you are an influencer. And so that's why you need a relationship with God. You have brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, grandparents. Did you know I was an influence on my grandparents? I was an influencer on my grandparents. Hmm? What kind of influence are you? A godly influence with standards? Or someone who's going to influence someone to get closer to the world instead of getting closer to God? I want to challenge you this morning. Don't get caught up in all the hype and all the crisis and all the fatigue. Rest in God. Can you rest in God? 
Hey, just rest in God and say, God, whatever you have, I'm going to believe you. Amen. Stand to your feet. I want you to just get uh, ready to pray with me and believe God. Some good things are happening. I want you to take that deep breath. And what is the first step on being able to not get fatigued? Resting God. Resting. Resting in God. What does that mean, resting in God? Not doing nothing at all? Just staying home? No. It means giving all your cares to God. Giving all your worries to God. Giving your anxiety to God. And letting Him take care of every situation. So right now, in the presence of God, I want you to begin to worship Him. And if you're tired... If you're tired, dad, whew, it's tough being a parent, much less in the middle of a crisis. I want you to rest in God and just say, God, I give you this family. I give you this family. I give you the situations that are coming up in my family. Lord, I'm going to do what you've called me to do, and the rest is up to you. I'm going to rest in you. Mom, it's tough managing a household in the middle of a crisis finances, budgets, needs, all kinds of changes happening all across America. Who do we offend? Who do we not offend? Hey, listen, forget about that and just say, God, I give you my family. I give you my spouse. Lord God, let me rest in you. The anxiety, all the, you're going to take care of everything. Come on, just, just rest in him right now. Oh, we rest in you, Lord Jesus. Come on, everybody in this place, just rest in God. Give your cares to God. Give your financial situation to God. Give your situation to God. All of that, let it rest in God's hands right now. Oh, Father, we bless you, Lord. Come on, just rest in Him right now before you leave this building. I don't want you to stress about anything. I want you to go knowing that God has everything under control. All I want you to concentrate on is God make me an influencer. Let me have a standard in my life that no matter what, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to worship you. And I'm going to draw closer to you, Lord God. I want to be that influence. I want you to trust in that and believe in that. And watch how God begins to give you rest. Oh, we bless you, Lord God. We honor you. We thank you, Father. As you're worshiping God there, I want the ushers to get ready. We're going to sow. What better way, what better way to release and to know that God has taken everything in control.